Hello, my name is Nana. I am a medical student at University of Queensland, studying to become a doctor. My grandma Shalan was a doctor before, but she became diabetic. My grandfather Colin knew nothing about diabetic before. It was simply not an issue in his early years. But when Shalan's food started to turn black, and the doctor started to talk about amputation, he knew it's the time to take it seriously. Diabetes is one of the fastest expanding of all diseases. To put it in perspective, some 6.6 .6 million people have died from COVID, but there are some 415 million people suffering from diabetes. For every person that has died from COVID, there are 63 people with diabetes. We place a lot of emphasis on COVID, but we think that diabetes is just a thing that's happening. But it is a very nasty disease. Every eight seconds, someone has a foot amputated from diabetes. We know a lot about diabetes and how to avoid it, yet we just take it as one of the things that's happening. Colin, initially trained as an engineer, had a history of innovation and was selected as one of the top 100 innovators by the Institute of Engineers. So let's make some interview with Colin. So Colin, what makes an innovator? Paradigm busting. Innovation is not about being particularly clever. You have to be technically competent, but the key is challenging established paradigms. And diabetes was a topic full of out-of-date paradigms. Yes, I agree with that. Paradigm is something that people change um, difficultly, but uh, it is a really important thing to break it through. So, um, what about some paradigms you find about diabetes? The first paradigm is that diabetes cannot be reversed. When Chulan was first diagnosed with diabetes, we were told by our medical advisor that diabetes was a chronic disease, meaning that there was no cure and it would just get worse and worse. We will give you stronger and stronger medicines and eventually you will need insulin injections and you will probably die young from a side effect of diabetes. When Shulan's foot first started to turn black and the doctor said it may be necessary to amputate the foot, I knew it was time to challenge the paradigm. So about challenge the paradigm, what did you do? Well, study the literature. We have the first rule of innovation to Thomas Edison. Study everything that is known about the subject, then put it to one side and start from scratch. There is a mass of information and research on diabetes. But as is normal in any innovation, the focus on a solution came from within existing technologies. In this case, a medical solution searching for a new pill to reverse diabetes. Innovations tend to come from outside the established technology. Paradigms are often broken from outside of the system. If you have diabetes, you go to a doctor and expect a pill or medical procedure. You do not go to a gardening shop, but that may be where the solution lays. So, from your studies and investigations, what did you find out about the thing that causes the diabetes? There were researchers who wanted to get right down to the root causes of diabetes. One of these was Professor Roy Taylor of Newcastle University in the UK. Roy explained that diabetes has two stages. The first stage was fat causing insulin resistance. Most people are not even aware there is a problem, as the pancreas simply makes more insulin, so life goes on as normal. In the second stage, fat enters the pancreas, so it can no longer create enough insulin, so the blood sugar level rises and diabetes becomes a real and serious problem. The key in the diabetes battle is to control the amount of fat our bodies store. So basically, um, there are a lot of fat in our body, but before they cause a real issue that we can see, no one will realize they got some problem in their body. Okay, so um, did you do any experiment with the diet and sugar level to you know confirm what you said? Absolutely. 
we brought a continuous blood sugar monitor and photographed every meal looking for connections. We did find some correlations, but nothing that you would call really significant. But we saw amazing spikes in her blood sugar levels, which bore no relation to diet, but were linked to the level of stress. So diabetes is all about fat, as you said. Did you find more paradigms about people being fat? Absolutely. Eating too much and not exercising. <laughs> so I had to ask myself, what really makes people fat? The conventional wisdom or paradigm is that simply eating too much and not exercising enough. But that is not a real answer. I want to know what makes people eat too much. Now, I have a bit of a tum, so I went on a diet. I sure lost weight, but one day I caught sight of myself in the mirror. My face looked like one of those pictures from the war when people were starving. Just cutting down on the amount of food we eat is not the solution. Yes, I totally agree with that. So you understood that the key to diabetes was how much fat the body stores. What did you find about that and, and what makes people fat? Well, I did find some very interesting research that was done in Holland. As you know, during the war, many people were starving and people were little more than skeletons. This was particularly true at the end of the war in Holland, where people were really starving. It turned out that these people who suffered a severe lack of food tended to put on a lot of weight and get really fat. It seems that our bodies have a built-in intelligence, a brain that decides whether to store fat or just poop it out. This is the second paradigm. The old paradigm is all about controlling calories. The new paradigm is about controlling our intelligence control system. So you have mentioned about the intelligent control system. Could you please tell us more about how did you find out more about this intelligent control system? Being an engineer, I realized that our bodies have an intelligent and automatic control system which manages our body without us even thinking. There's one set of experiments which were really groundbreaking. They took two mice, one fat and the other skinny, and they collected the poo from each mouse and fed it to the other mouse. Mice naturally eat each other's poo. Surprisingly, the fat mouse became skinny and the skinny mouse became fat. This discovery was clearly one of those seminal moments in science when a major discovery is made. So, are you saying that our intelligent control system is just in our gut? Absolutely not. This intelligent control system has two parts. There is our head brain, which is made up from our DNA, which we cannot change. That is why some people are naturally fat and others thin. Some people are naturally skinny while others are fat, regardless of the amount of food they eat. And that is because of the DNA in our head brain, which we can't do much about. Then there is our gut brain, trillions of cells which communicate with each other, acting just like some supercomputers. We tend to think of our bodies as made up from a number of separate organs, but we are a total system, not a collection of bits. Our gut brain and head brain work together as a system to control our bodies. Unfortunately, we have no idea of the code that drives this supercomputer, but we do know that it can be changed to work in a very different way. Mm. I would like to know more about the fat and skinny mice experiment. Could you please tell me more about that? Yep. Uh, <laughs> the experiments on mice were repeated many times, so there is no doubt it is true. And surprisingly, it was not only fatness that could be changed. Timid mice could be made outrageously brave. They simply had no fear of cats, while other mice could be turned into neurotic mice, afraid to move from the safety of their home. So how does the mice story apply to humans? It is our intelligent control system. Now, humans generally do not go around eating each other's poo, but the technique was developed of facial transplants which has a similar results to the experiments on mice. People don't get fed simply because they eat too much. They get fed because their intelligent control system decides. For whatever reason, 
The body needs to store more fat and send out instruction to eat more. You have mentioned all of that, but there is a clear correlation between eating too much and getting fat. How do you explain that? Correlation is not cause. There is certainly a correlation between eating too much and getting fat. But eating too much is not the real cause. The real cause is because our intelligent control system has decided we need to store more fat and then sends out signals to eat more. So eating more correlates with getting fat, but it is not the real cause, which is that our intelligent control system has decided that we need to store more fat. Like the people in Holland, their intelligent control system has learnt the dangers of lack of food and has decided to store any food that comes along. So people got fat. Yeah, you have told me that when you were a kid, um, you have never heard of diabetics. Yet it is now at epidemic proportions. What has changed with diabetes? We used to eat food that led to a healthy gut. I was facing the problem of why diabetes was simply not a significant issue when I was young. But it's now at epidemic proportions. I decided this was because when I was young, we were eating a natural diet with food for the microbes, which led to a healthy gut. So what's wrong with our modern food society? Surely there's plenty healthy food out there available. Our modern food may be hygienic, but it is inert. So you simply are not getting the right sort of microbes in our gut brain. Another factor is that modern food is full of energy food, sugar and fats, and is often deficient in critical minerals. So again, our intelligent control system senses this and makes us hungry, so we overeat. What is often called empty calories. So after all this, what do you say is the real cause of getting fat? Eating the wrong sort of food. The real cause of getting fat, over which we have control, is eating the sort of food which leads to the wrong sort of gut microbes. Another cause is deficiency in critical minerals. Our bodies sense this lack of minerals and send out signals to make us hungry and eat more of the sort of food which is available, so we end up getting fat. Yes, I have heard about that. Like people have saying, if you are lacking of um, sodium, you tend to want to eat chips. <laughs> so, what can we do about this? The solution is straightforward. Incorporate into our diet the microbes and minerals which has formed part of our diet for thousands of years. There have been many studies on the gut biology of modern hunter-gatherers. They have much healthier guts than people living a western lifestyle and it varies with the season. In winter, when winter foods are eaten, they have a Pacific gut biome and when summer comes and their diet changes, their gut biome changes too. This is important because it shows we can simply change our gut biome by what we eat. We can simply change our gut biome by what we eat. So coming back to the paradigm we're talking about, is there any shift in the paradigm that diabetes is reversible? Yes, there's a significant shift to recommend changes in diet to more plant-based diet. While the recommendations are about eating more vegetables, there's little consideration about the soil that the plants are grown in. You may have, say, kale, which is grown in inert soil and eaten well after it is harvested. This may have some benefit, but it is nothing compared to eating kale grown in nutrient-rich, biologically active soil directly after it has been harvested. Eating food fresh is very important. In the blue zones, where people are fit and healthy, right up to a right old age, they are picking and eating plants while they are still fresh. They actually taste much better too. Taste is very important. It is the tool that has evolved to make sure we eat the right sort of food. Unfortunately, much of our food is saturated with sugars, which masks the natural flavours. Adding plants to our diet helps. But for real benefits, the plants should be grown in nutrient-rich, biologically active soil. So after you said that, how can we grow the right sort of food to feed our gut? Modify wicking beds to make G-biota beds. I was a pioneer of wicking beds which naturally control the moisture level and I could see how this technology could be readily modified to breed the beneficial biology 
which forms our gut brain. I modified these wicking beds to breed the beneficial biota and called these beds G-biota beds. Just saying eat less, exercise more, it's too simplistic. Actually, we should eat more, not less, but eat the right sort of food, then we'll naturally want to eat less. Breed the beneficial biota in the soil. They move into the plant by osmosis. Then we eat the plants as natural pre and probiotics. So as an innovator, how does your experiences with diabetes compare with the story of other innovators? Very similar. Whenever there is a problem, the experts will generally look for a solution in their area of expertise. We call this silo effect. So doctors with the best of intentions look for a medical solution. They are unlikely to ask a gardener how to reverse diabetes. But that different technology could be the key to success. Why do you think diabetes is now so prevalent, but was very rare when you were young? It is simply the way we grow our food. When I was a kid, we ate lots of food that was grown locally in soil that was fertilized by recycling waste. While we have made great strides in reducing more food with chemical industrial agriculture, we have lost the benefits of growing food that has been the norm over thousands of years. That is the way we evolved. But can we go back to the old method? No, there are simply too many people on earth, so we need the benefits of modern high production. Mm. But we don't need to change all our food. Some 80% of the food we eat is simply burned off for energy, simply burning carbon and hydrogen to produce energy. About 15% is used to replace our body parts as they age and wear. And only about 5% is used to feed our gut brain. We can easily grow that in local farms or even in our gardens or on a balcony or windowsill. We cannot go back to the old ways, but we can learn from what worked in the past to create a new technology which works. So we now have the technical solution. What other problems could there be? What people want to know is will it work for them? This is a simple and economic solution, but it has the same problems that every innovator faces. How to create the paradigm shift so people make the change. People need to be convinced that the solution will work for them. The situation is made more complicated as we have two brains. Some people have a DNA in their head brain, which means they will never suffer from getting fat and diabetics, while other have a DNA in their head brain, which means they'll get fat and diabetic, regardless of how the gut biome is changed. That means for some people, even if they eat veggies full of beneficial microbiota, they could eventually develop into diabetic, right? Um, if that's so, why should they still eat those vegetables? All people are different. Some people will be able to reverse their diabetes by incorporating gut food into their diet. Others will still be diabetic, whatever we do. What we can do is improve the odds. We need a trial to find out what proportion of the people can reverse their diabetes. But that should not stop us changing our diet to eat food to feed our gut brain. Changing the gut brain could mean that millions of people could be prevented from becoming diabetic or their diabetes could be reversed. People are different. Some are totally resistant to diabetes, others highly prone. We may not be able to solve diabetes for everyone, but we can shift the bell-shaped curve to help many. As a medical student from University of Queensland, I can see how the tertiary education is putting focus on the relationship between human gut intelligence and these chronic diseases. However, I can also see how the existing paradigm is restricting the school and the professors to research only within a small area. Hence, when heard about Collins' investigations and after studying a bit more about food science, I believe this longitudinal project can really prevent people from getting their food amputated. Now, Colin, can you give us a bit more about this project? Fortunately, this is a trial which does not need the massive expenditure typical of these trials. Anyone with a garden can set up their own g biota beds to breed the needed microbes in the soil. And even if, even if they don't have a garden, they can have a g biota box sitting on their windowsill growing plants. They just need a contact 
who can supply the soil full of microbes and minerals, which are the key feature of the G-Biota system. So here I am asking people to join us with this project. There is no harm to grow nice food in your garden while you can physically contribute to this project to help others. So how can people participate? Join our social media site. So I ask you, if you have an interest in participating in this trial, please contact Colin on his website www.gbiota.com. Go to trial under the Gbiota news section and either register your interest or simply email Colin directly. Thank you for your collaborations.